Hey, hey, everybody. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for asking. Hey, we have got a guest from the Bronx in the house today. I'm so excited. We guys, this conversation, I'll tell you, we have been counting down the days to have Melissa on the podcast. So So we're going to try to contain our giddiness a little bit. (laughs) We are, we are so excited. We're talking to Melissa C. Potter. She is the head of social impact and DEI and communications for Transform Films and Odyssey Impact. But she has had this really amazing career but just this thread of philanthropy through her life. And I think there's just so much to take of just how she has um, shaped a career around making a difference and really taking her gifts and combining those into this really, really meaningful role that she has um, right now through Odyssey Impact. So I want to tell you a little bit about it, and then I'm going to kick it over to Melissa to fill in the gaps that I've left out. But she started her career working in public relations with chart-topping entertainment, such as The Roots, A Tribe Called Quest, Grandmaster Flash. My Can mind is shout exploding outs? right now. <laughs> <laughs> and she was a freelance publicist with the Catalyst Group and Cool Hunters and partnered with Amazon, Audible, Netflix, goodness, all the big guys. But she was always building a philanthropic dimension in her work. Um, Now she's using film, technology, entertainment, and new media as a catalyst for social change. So these are the kind of things that you see of just like movements. And that's what we really want to talk about today is movements created from just using all the mediums that we have available to us today. And so Melissa and her team are creating these really, really powerful documentaries that are not just posted and done, but really trying to transform the narrative and the community and the discussions that come out of it. So she has been winning all the awards you can imagine. So all the way up to the 2018 NAACP Image Award nominee um, for her work with The Rape of Reese Taylor, one of the many films that they have put out that is really incredible. So I would love to kick it over to Melissa to just kind of fill in the gaps for us. But thank you for being here, Melissa. You're a rock star. Thank you for having me. Um, When I hear the experience on paper, I'm like, I've done a lot, but... (laughs) It's gone by fast and it's been really unconventional. If I could name one keyword to describe and encompass my career to date, it would be unconventional. I (laughs) knew from an early age that entertainment was actually my passion. I went to Northeastern University for undergrad as a music industry major. Yeah, and then I realized, oh no, you have to learn how to play an instrument here. And that's not gonna work for me. (laughs) I'd rather (laughs) tell other people what to do. Kazoos don't work probably at Northeastern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that was a part of the curriculum at the time. So I said, okay, how am I gonna navigate? We have, it was a five-year program. For four years, you go to school for six months and then you work in your field of choice full-time for six months. And I said, you know, I can get my work experience in the music business, but then get my degree in something else that I'm passionate about. And so that ended up being sociology, getting to learn about people and cultures and really immersing myself into the early stages of what was that unique space of social impact. Um, It didn't have a name almost 20 years ago, um, but now we know it as what we'll talk a bit more about today. Um, And then at the same time, getting that music business experience, I got to work for Def Jam Records and lead all the New England area promotions. So anytime artists would come to town, we would do their radio tours and concert dates. And it was very crazy. There were many nights (laughs) when my mom was calling my roommate, like, where's Melissa at two o'clock? She's not answering. I'm like, I'm on stage. (laughs) Living her best life. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Working around the clock. And so for uh, the subsequent four years, I just had some amazing internships and cooperative education experiences with some of the top names in entertainment today. Uh, someone like Mona Scott, who started the Love and Hip Hop franchise on VH1, wow. was a mentor, and I served as her assistant and got to really learn a lot about being a woman in this business and how you can navigate uh, being a wife, being a mom, being a woman, and still kind of leading the charge and working with the team. Uh, so from there, I started to do a bit of entertainment PR, kind of as a solo practitioner, then partnering with some amazing boutique agencies. And we worked primarily with hip hop artists. What I recognized was that 
there was a need to counter bad press with good. And I kind of sat back and said, how can we do this? Oh my goodness, let's do the turkey giveaway at Thanksgiving. Let's do uh, dress up like Santa Claus and go visit, you know, doing really good heart felt work, but it also served a dual purpose. And when 50 Cent was, you know, <laughs> in the cover of the New York Post for gun violence, unfortunately, how do we pivot that story? Because it's all about spin in the Give world. Give them some turkeys yard. to pass out. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And so after doing a couple of those kind of engagements, working with the roots in the city of Philadelphia, bringing um, instruments back in classrooms, I recognized that there was something to the nonprofit side that I really wanted to learn and lean in on based on my education in uh, sociology. So from there, I said, you know what, let me kind of go in house and see what the needs are that we can help fulfill from the entertainment side, working with talent, working with thought leaders that can make a change and start a movement. Uh, but what are the budgets that are needed for it? What is the staffing and the manpower needed from a nonprofit to capitalize on the moment when it's presented to them? So I joined the NAACP Legal Defense Fund nonprofit um, legal oriented towards social justice advocacy and outreach as their manager and then acting director of communications. And from there, I got to learn hands-on from the advancement teams and the communications teams and then the legal staff almost as clients. What are the needs? How do we craft the message? How much money does it take? Do we need to outsource? You know, what are the capabilities that we have in-house? Um, and then I continued on to other organizations like the ACLU working on issues of criminal justice and women's rights and voting rights. Um, progressive experience again continued in education with the National Family Engagement Alliance and from there this incredible role with Odyssey Impact and Transform Films kind of leading social impact using documentary, documentary films as a tool for messaging because, you know, it's so easy to use whether legalese or complex language, but people know people and people know stories and stories resonate. And when you're able to show a film and really have someone immerse themselves in the story of other that they may not see in their day to day, they're able to walk away with a better understanding of how they can affect change how they can change attitudes and then how they can drive themselves toward an action pertinent to the issue at hand. So it's been an amazing time. And I've been holding this news for, we are good, but I'm actually joining Viacom CBS as vice president of social. What? Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Did we just have our first news announcement yes. on our podcast. Yes. That's amazing. Oh my gosh. Congrats. So I'm, Super excited, as wow. I mentioned, uh, my early work experiences were in entertainment. And when I was 18, my first ever job and internship was at Viacom. So it's Amazing. a wow. full, full circle, full circle. moment. Well, oh congratulations. I, I cannot think of somebody who has the heart and the passion like you do to go out and take that job and just light it on fire. And I appreciate so much what you just said about storytelling because the three of us we all love documentaries we sometimes come in here and talk about who's watch what on what netflix on a given weekend <laughs> yeah. and um, if you're someone who's very curious just about what other people experience and what is it like in x you know documentaries allow you to go there and just mm -hmm. have this very compelling and raw way to um, right. share stories about humans that are sometimes not that pretty. And so I want you to talk a little bit about Odyssey impacting your films, because we were talking before we actually started recording, we got lost on Melissa's mm. YouTube, on Instagram, <laughs> on these videos, and you get sucked in to these yeah. issues. And I just think it's fascinating. So can you talk a little bit about these films and, and Absolutely. what your goal is? Yeah. And I think it's a testament to the quality of 
the stories that we're able to tell that even though I am moving on in a full-time capacity, I am still going to be working with Odyssey Impact mm -hmm. um, as executive producer on a film called Run for His Life that was just acquired by Condé Nast. And it's I, I need wow. to talk to you about this film because, because the trailer, yeah, the trailer yeah, alone awesome. will do something. People, we're going to put this trailer in the show notes. Mm -hmm. I watched it and, and I run with my father, you know, two days a week. And so this really, I was crying within a minute and a half, which that has not happened since I watched Up, the Pixar um, film where you start crying like immediately. But it is massively powerful. And I am just so, so appreciative much. of you telling the story story about the effect the long-term effects of mass incarceration it was Absolutely. poignant in three minutes I felt Thank myself you. rise up and want to be a part of it so yes please talk about that yeah I'm looking forward to seeing the full version we uh, had the pleasure of being at hot docs this year the American Black Film Festival also uh, South by Southwest mm -hmm. about a year ago in the early stages of the film's creation and on a personal note, that's actually the story of my husband, who you <gasps> may have seen before we got started. I yeah. did not realize that. <laughs> who was not my husband at the time. So I will tell you the irony of that story. We were friends for 10 plus years. And I mentioned he's a photographer. So I hired him to come into Odyssey and take our headshots. And I apologize. I live in an apartment. If you hear some buzzing, okay. Amazon is trying to get to me desperately. <laughs> Her apartment that she can see Yankee Sorry. Stadium from the Everyone's window. Poker face though. Yeah. I thought I was the only one hearing it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm dying or something on on screen. Okay, I'm so I, soaked I into this story though. I hired my husband Pete Monsanto to do headshots for our CEO Nick Stewart. I walked away to the restroom. I came back out and Nick in his lovely British accent said, Melissa, we're making a movie on Pete's life. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> so they got into a very, very touching conversation on mass incarceration based on Odyssey Impact and Transform Films Serving Life, which was acquired by the OWN Network quite a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And it looked at, um, how can I say, the caretaking of prisoners in their last days mm -hmm. by their peer inmates and kind of what that full cycle of life behind bars really looks like as you're nearing your, your end and your, your final destination. So in their conversation about that, Pete mentioned that his father, my now father-in-law, uh, is serving life in prison himself. And so Pete is one of seven children and his dad was unfairly sentenced under some pre-existing Rockefeller era drug laws. So to this day, you know, 35 years later, we're still fighting and hopeful that he'll be able to see his family again, his beautiful grandchildren. Um, but Pete really in Run For His Life talked about running as a meditation, running as a way to um, set a goal that his father was never able to achieve as someone passionate about fitness and athleticism, which was running uh, and completing the 2018 New York City Marathon, which is about 26.2 miles. And so the story kind of unfolds with uh, Pete talking about his childhood and the moment that he heard the knocks at the door living in a 5,000 square foot home and the next moment spending the next decade in shelters and not knowing where he was going to get his next meal oftentimes. It also shows the, the fortitude and the love that a mom can have when taking her children through this unfortunate journey um, but making them feel like they never missed out on anything. So doing whatever his mom had to do to make special moments, whether it was cooking her insanely famous mac and cheese and just <laughs> having that put a smile on their face, but also maintaining that regular communication with his dad. Um, because it is possible for parents to parent from prison, from behind bars. And I think a lot of people... Um, ostracize or cast away their family 
if they know that they're not able to see them regularly or, you know, in the outside world. But his father maintains an, a presence daily through phone calls, through letters, and in-person visits that helped him become the man that he is today. And so <clears throat> in filming Run For His Life, we're like, oh, I, I like you, friend. <laughs> and here we go a couple of years later with a 13 month old probably is serving beautiful. as executive producer of the film wow. uh, and it's just been a fantastic journey and we're looking forward to seeing in October November of 2020 what Condé Nast is going to do because they are talking about partnerships with folks like Common and Van Jones uh, a feature in GQ magazine. So it's just been absolutely incredible. John, we're so wow. out of our element here. I like know. the <laughs> amount, I mean, it is like we are in our little Oklahoma mm -hmm. home. And oh. this is so, I say our, our home. home. It's, it's, not, it's not our Becky home. Does not live this here. is, yes, this is why people think we're married. <laughs> but I need to, I, I might. I, I'm just so transformed and transfixed by this story because I sent the trailer to my running group yesterday oh, wow. and our running group is all parents and their kids. And mm. it, did, it just naturally happened that way. And I think the line that took me to my knees, I'm already getting emotional when I think about it, is when he says, I'm going to be your legs outside the prison. Yes. I'm going to do this. And that, and I think about all the races over 20 years that I have run with my father and not having him there, that just struck me. And I just think that that is such an amazing thing that you're doing, that you're able to take this art and this humanity and pour it into these films. So um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned showing the trailer to your running group because that's the ethos of what Odyssey Impact does is we bring cohorts of people together, whether they're community groups, parents, uh, children and students and say, you know what, let's watch this film as a collective. And then we provide resources to help guide their viewing experience so that they're learning from the experts about issues of mass incarceration, about um, children of incarcerated parents, whether it's through a first person narrative or exercises that you can do as a collective. Um, and so it's not just screening the film and kind of leaving you alone with your emotions. We create these robust guides that work you through, uh, you know, your attitude around it. Emotional healing is a big part of something that we want to own and respect as people go through the viewing process of really complex and heart wrenching films and issues in most cases. And then we leave you with next steps that you can take. We've had church groups start shuttle services to take their children of incarcerated parents to see their parents on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And that can be many, many hours away. It can be costly on family. When you go to visit a prison, if you wanna buy lunch, you know, a pack of Cheetos or a Hot Pocket is gonna start at $10. Oh my um, because they know that they have you there and you're a captive Monopoly. audience and you're just gonna spend. And so to be able to support through fundraising initiatives that some groups have done, um, the children that are going. So that's just one example. And I could go through many other films and cases where the film has really been a catalyst for creating change and making a movement through whether it was a group of two or a group of 2000. Just so many ways I want to go, but I would love to, to kind of circle back because there's a lot of young non-professional type folks non-profit non professionals they're very we always call them non-professionals non <laughs> but they maybe are non-professionals sometimes you have to be a non-professional to get the job right? done in the, the authenticity <laughs> factor yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> melissa i just think you know it's just cool to sit back and see that you get to be part of these stories that are human one-to-one -one. they're human mm -hmm. especially with your husband you know so close to you but they get magnified so they can lead generational change, you know, to these big issues. What, what can you tell somebody that's getting started in their career of like, how do you connect these dots? You're clearly very gifted in this space yeah. um, and connecting people. How did you have a vision to say, I, this is where I want to go. You may not know exactly what your title was going to be, mm -hmm. but how mm -hmm. did you have that vision all along and, and stay true to the course to, to be in this place today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember in 2012, I just 
in onboarding in my new role, I had to find some old documents and I had my offer letter from the ACLU and it was for $100,000. And that was the first time that I hit that mark. I went to a nightclub with friends. I don't remember <laughs> the night. I'm rich. I'm rich. <laughs> 14 months later, I left the job, decided to work for myself, and I went to negative $3,000 in my bank. Yes. <laughs> Eating ramen at home from the nightclub to ramen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh... But in that time, it was really recognizing how powerful building a network would be. And so for me, I took the leap um, knowing that I had this tremendous experience. I learned from the best people that I could. And I felt confident that I could try on my own to see what uh, working for myself, working with entertainers would be like. I left, I had no roster. Mm -hmm. I went on a trip to Cuba and I was on a flight coming back and Grandmaster Flash happened to be a couple of rows away from oh me. My oh my gosh. So I noted him and I said, oh my gosh. So, so when we get to the luggage carousel, this is what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna, you know, get my elevator pitched together. I'm writing it out on the napkin that Jet blew past me. <laughs> and I, 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 I offered to work for free. And that was, you know, build your network, offer to give time for free. Um, because so many times I'll get inquiries on LinkedIn or Instagram. Can you help me? And I'm like, I, I want to help everyone, but I don't have the capacity. And I've also been burned. You know, I've opened up my heart and my network to quite a few people who took advantage of it. Um, so I had to say, you know, what made me successful and what advice would I give? Offer your expertise for free. So with Grandmaster Flash, I said, you know, I used to work for these top tier PR agencies. I know that you have this incredible Netflix show coming up. Don't pay me anything. Let me do your PR. From there, we spent nearly two years together and I was able to meet the team at Good Morning America when we did Morning Press. I was able to meet the team at Netflix and show them how professional I was, how skilled I was. Uh, I think I was... 29, 28, 29. Um, so for me, it was really showcasing what I could contribute and then brand growth through association. Once people saw that I was affiliated with these high tier, um, whether it was periodicals or blogs, websites and the like at the time, they said, oh my God, you're, you're someone cool. And when I, I jokingly say smoke and mirrors, that's a lot of what social media is. You can mm -hmm. tease out something that you're doing and because it's not a part of someone's every day, they're excited about by it. And so people would see me with Grandmaster Flash and say, you know, why don't you work with this one? Why don't you work with that one? And organically, I started to build what became a fabulous and a high grossing uh, PR agency. And I got to hire some of my friends, um, but closed mouths don't get fed. And you have to speak yeah. up. You have to fake it till you make it, but also don't take advantage of the opportunities given when you're faking it. Because you have somebody's career in your hands or you have an organization who's entrusting you with uh, leading them in the right direction. So you wanna be honest about what you're able to do mm. and what you want to learn. Um, so for me, it was you know speaking up, knowing what I was capable of, knowing what my gaps were in my education process and how I could learn on the ground from my peers, from those higher and below. Um, I've learned a lot from interns over the years about social media that I had no idea how to do before. Um, so yeah, I, I think giving of your time for free is the biggest thing that I could advise back when I started my career was when internships were unpaid um, and things have changed. Now there's an expectation that you're going to make minimum wage and higher, that your transportation is going to get covered. I took out tons of Sally May loans to sustain myself and wanting to live in Manhattan during my work experiences and put food in my belly and be able to, you know, wear the clothes that I needed to fit in and, and so on and so forth. So 
that investment in yourself is super important. Um, and then the willingness to say, you know what, don't pay me, let me just try it out for you. And more often than not, if it's not something that a nonprofit is going to need to supervise, because supervision is timely and costly too on staff, um, I would say they'd be willing and open to letting you kind of come in and, and direct them as need be. With nonprofits, I would also suggest that the process of kind of building out your resume is something that in this giving of your time, when you're looking to pivot into the space or you're looking to advance yourself in your career, you can put it on your resume that while in your day job, you may not have opportunities to fulfill the various roles that you need to elevate and to learn and expand upon your resume and your LinkedIn portfolio and your bio, you can do it. And no one's going to know that you didn't necessarily get paid for it right. and put that nonprofit on your resume and the various bullets. So, you know, multitask, have your day job. And then if you're looking to segue into the space, have your nighttime activities that you're doing pro bono, but it's allowing you to build out a robust portfolio of your day-to-day -day duties. Melissa just gave a masterclass <laughs> on how to build the career of your dreams in four if, minutes. <laughs> I wish anyone could see me, no cameras on me. I was over here being a bobblehead. My 24 year old yeah. self was like, Julie's yes. texting, can, yes. I, can I do this for free? You know, to oh, get in these doors, so, yes. It's so true. I think so many people my age, I'm 24, Melissa. I think so mm -hmm. many people very at the start of their careers want their dream job. So I love hearing that. It's like, we kind of have to grind these next 10 years and give of our time, give of our service. We don't have kids. We don't have families yet. Absolutely. So I, I was over now, here nodding my head with you. Perfect <laughs> time for it. Move back home. You know, don't yes. let ego get in your way. Yes. I would have saved a lot of money and not taken out private student loans if I did that. But hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love that advice. And I also just like this theme of boldness that you're talking about and fearlessness that sometimes you just kind of have to take that plunge. And I, I so admire your ability to just say, I, I can just see her wheels turning uh -huh. like on that Love plane it. of like zeroing in grandmaster flash. Here is my plan. Here are the steps. Here's what I'm going to say. It's like, mm -hmm. that is a very organized thinker there. There is someone that's ambitious there. That's going to go out. And if that's you and you feel hungry, I mean, that's mm -hmm. such good advice. And I think that documentary films live in that bold space. I mean, it Absolutely. is such a brave space. And mm -hmm. I think the thing that I like so much about it that jives with our company is, you know, we have this core value that we want to play the long game. We think that there is greater gains in not just doing something for a quick mm -hmm. win. We want to invest mm -hmm. long term because we yeah. want to have a radical change in the world. And so I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about this, because I'm so fascinated by the storytelling and and um, the topics that are in Odyssey films, because these are heavy topics, people. I sure. mean, we're talking about um, not only just gun violence, but, but Odyssey is going in and interviewing Newtown and Sandy Hook parents. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, we're talking about women, you know, who have been sexually assaulted. We're talking about incarceration. Mm -hmm. These are heavy, heavy mm -hmm. topics, but we cannot turn away from them. So I want you to talk just a little bit about how you infuse that boldness in there and how you've been able to positively change the world with these films. Oh, thank you. Well, all credit goes to the people that are open their hearts, minds, and voices to share their stories with us. That's some boldness. That's some bravery yeah, for a new town parent to, to sit down. Yes, for your husband. Absolutely. Husband in the other room, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Newtown. I have to say, I, to this day, have not been able to watch the film. The trailer alone was so jarring and shocking to me that I said, one day I'll have like the emotional preparedness that it takes to sit through it. But just getting to meet um, many of the families, uh, the pastors that were involved and learning from them has been more than enough um, for me to recognize just how important their stories being told is out in the world. Um, and being bold, like I said, finding people that are open to affect change through difficult experiences that they've had 
they're, they're the most bold people that I can imagine. I've had the pleasure of working uh, on the film Milwaukee 53206 mm. and the Walker family out of Wisconsin. It's a great one. You there. should go look at it. People. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I encourage everyone, Milwaukee53206.com briefly tells the story of the zip code that incarcerates the highest number of Black men in the country. And by the age of 30, nearly 60% of Black men have entered the criminal justice system. And so we looked at uh, the story of Baron Walker and his family, Baron, who was serving time uh, for a crime that he admits to doing as a young man. It was a strong arm slash armed robbery in the eyes of the law, but he was unfairly sentenced. And so through the exposure of the film and the boldness of his wife, Beverly, just hitting the ground and using her story and her voice, but also the film as a catalyst uh, to affect change, actually led to the uh, Judiciary Department, the prosecutors in uh, Milwaukee finding out about Marin and recognizing that he was in fact unfairly sentenced. And the film was the catalyst for the day that he was released from prison. And I had the honor of being in the courtroom when it happened. What did that feel like? Like, I want to pause and I want you to talk about that moment. What was that? What was the air like? What was the energy level like? Well, we, we never create films with an intended goal. They've all kind of evolved holistically based on the wonderful people that have shown the films in their groups, organizations, you know, watched it at home on Netflix and came to us to say, how can I help? What can I do? And so in giving them ideas and it kind of organically growing within an impact campaign, uh, the, um, Emory University School of Theology decided to do a letter writing campaign. And so on Barron's behalf, the Candler uh, Theology School students got together. I think it was about a group of 30 or 40. They wrote these impassioned letters after viewing the film. And from there really enhanced the attention that the uh, documentary had organically had and the reputation it had in the Milwaukee area. And to be able to see kind of where this one creative idea started, you know, as a production team and finding the best filmmaker to tell that story, finding the best cast that we could hone in on um, because they wanted to call attention to a really unfair and unjust system uh, within criminal law reform. From there, actually filming the film and then getting to say, you know, what, what, issues can we uplift? In what ways is it going to resonate with people? And then just the full cycle of the film getting the attention of, you know, folks on the ground that knew this space very well, and it leading to that moment where I was just sitting in tears in the very hard wooden pew in the back of the courtroom getting to see Baron um, apologized to by the, uh, by the judge for the amount of time that he did over the length that he should have served. And the moment that his beautiful wife embraced him Mm -hmm. and his children saw him from behind bars after many, many, many years, upwards of 20 years at that point, was really, really, I think one of the, the most moving moments of my life next to having my daughter, um, because I saw that a family had a chance again, a family had a chance to be a family. And what that means, you know, football games on Saturday, Sunday, soul food cooking, and just Barron's opportunity to, you know, reform. And that's what we have to realize that the criminal justice system is for punishment, but also reform. And when you have someone that has taken every opportunity in that transformative change and can go out and be an example and a shining light, that's all that you wanna see um, because there's more to it. And I think that um, as a whole, the system needs to learn about stories like this, needs to see people like Baron Uplifted who can become incredibly um, 
you know, entrenched and impassioned members of society again when given the chance. So it gives me goosebumps just thinking Mm -hmm. about what, you know, after 20 plus years, he's a fairly young man in his mid 40s can start life again and help others in his community so that Milwaukee 53206 is no longer the zip code associated with such dire statistics. Mm -hmm. This is such important work. I mean, I had honestly never heard of the social impact entertainment industry until I saw your um, bio. And I just think it's so fantastic. And I just wonder about all the other barons that are out there that don't have a platform or this art to tell their story. And I just, I think what you're doing is massively important in telling stories that liberate the marginalized is is such a conduit to goodness and to healing and to reformation and i just i just think it's fantastic thank you for sharing that story yeah i completely agree and i think when you were talking about the community kind of coming together to that moment that was in the courtroom i just think what a calling that each of us have a small part to play in that you know it wasn't just the producer it wasn't the director it wasn't the family saying yes Mm -hmm. although all those pieces Mm -hmm combined but what a beautiful testament that everybody can play a role in this even the viewer and those that wrote letters um to impacting change so what a beautiful story Mm -hmm. thank you so much for that um melissa i feel for sure we could go into like three hours with you on this podcast but i know (laughs) you're a busy person (laughs) (laughs) no her baby needs her yes we ask every one of our guests what is one good thing that you know you could do today maybe it's a life hack maybe it's a tip a mindset mantra what is something that you would impart on us that you could do that's, you know, resonates with your journey? Uh, I serve as chair of the board of directors for a nonprofit based out of New York called Fostering Change for Children. And I'd say becoming a board member for a nonprofit is one of the things that I would encourage all of your viewers and listeners to do. Um, as I said, it's an opportunity to uplift the skills that you can bring that might have tremendous effects on organizations that are underfunded or don't have the necessary manpower and bandwidth to um, do things, whether it's photo and video, or if you are an amazing illustrator, you can work with them to make a, a logo and create their brand. Um, there's so many ways that you can um, really help an organization go from, you know, their baby incubator stage to, you know, someone that gets the attention of a huge sponsor. Um, so alignment with a nonprofit and board service is something that I would say, you know, go to the United Way's board serve program. They'll give you free training. They'll connect you with organizations that align with your individual passions, whether that be working with uh, children in the foster care system or um, breast cancer awareness or criminal law reform, any number of things that you could think of, there's an opportunity there where just one person and the skills that you bring forward can truly affect change. Um, Not all nonprofits um, require a gift or a give and get. So if money is a barrier for you don't worry about that you're not necessarily going to have to open your pocket but you can open your heart and mind um, to have an impact and to create some fabulous change for tons of organizations no matter where you are that's such good advice and i I mean i would even piggyback on it and say if you can't be a board member if you don't have the time volunteer i mean we have a significant base of our listenership who is not in the nonprofit sector but they care about serving their community they care about people and it's like these nonprofits. they need your hustle they need Mm -hmm. your hands they need your ideas they need your gifts so find a way that you can lean in thank you so much for that great advice how can people connect with melissa c potter um where are you on social and uh how can they find some of your stories please do um instagram is melissa c potter you can also find me on LinkedIn, linkedin.com backslash Melissa Potter PR. Um, I love to mentor. I love to share advice. I do give a lot of content away for folks that are upcoming, whether it be through articles or just, you know, 
talking to myself in the car as I'm driving and sharing <laughs> things that might come to mind. Um, time, talent, treasure. Those are the three things that I would say for your audiences that are interested in the nonprofit space. You can give of your time, you can give of a talent, and you can open your wallet and give of your treasures. But any of the three or all of the three are going to make a difference today. Your daughter's a lucky girl. Oh, thank you so much. Thank Thank you so much for spending so much time with us and just inspiring us with your work. And 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 really congrats on your next chapter. I know it's exciting. We're gonna it's gonna be interesting and fascinating to watch your journey. So um and I definitely want to see Ren for his life. So we'll we'll follow that. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for having me. Right back at you. Thank you. Bye bye.